I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. Uh, we're continuing our Just Jesus series. Uh, if you're newer to Calvary, we've been looking at the Gospel of Luke for a year, uh, all this year, and we're going to spend the rest of the year in it, looking at the life of Jesus, what he teaches, how he interacts with people, how we can see him up close and understand him better. And, and so uh, today we're, we're continuing our battle series. Uh, by the way, if you don't have a Bible with you, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the pews around you, pews, <laughs> seats around you, and uh, some habits die hard, right? Uh, the seats around you, turn to page 1116 and you will find the Gospel of Luke chapter 18. And by the way, if you don't have a Bible and you want to read one, take one of these with you. We want you to have the Word of God, read the Word of God, because we know it will change your life. So today we're, uh, we're finishing up our battle series. For this month, we have been talking about the battle that we're fighting, the spiritual battles. Uh, we've talked about the battle with temptation, the battle with fear. Last week, Pastor O.C. preached on the battle with pride. And, and today we're going to kind of wrap that up by looking at another area of life that all of us struggle with or affected by one way or another, and that's our battle with greed. And, and we're going to begin by looking at the story. Uh, looking at an encounter between Jesus and a young man that is found in Luke chapter 18, beginning at verse 18. If, you're, uh, if you grew up in church, you know this is the story of the rich young ruler. And uh, it's found in the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Mark. And all of them uh, have the same story, just slightly different uh, details. So we know this guy was rich, young, and a ruler. So here we go, Math, uh, Matthew, Luke 18, beginning in verse 18. And a ruler asked Jesus, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, All of these I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. And Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, How difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said, then who can be saved? And Jesus said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And Peter said, see, Lord, we have left our homes and followed you. And Jesus said to them, truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more in, his, in this time and in the age to come eternal life. The ruler approaches Jesus and asks the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to inherit eternal life? That's what frames this entire conversation, this entire discussion. And this is the important question, the most important question. Because we all want to know, how do I get to heaven? How do I know that my sins are forgiven? How do I know that death is defeated? And, and so we want to know this, and this ruler wanted to know it. He, he came to Jesus, and he was a rich man. He was a young man. He was a man of power, of influence. He was uh, involved. The ruler part was of a synagogue. He was like the uh, pastor of a church kind of thing. And then Jesus answers him. Gives him a very simple, straightforward answer. Follow me. Follow me. Uh, maybe you missed that. Verse 22, it's kind of wrapped up in some other stuff. It says, when Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack, sell all that you have, distribute to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. The invitation that Jesus gave to the crowds was, come follow me. The invitation that Jesus gave to the disciples was, leave your, your profession, leave your job, leave your tax tables, leave your nets, and come follow me. And Jesus is still inviting us to follow him. Follow him because you believe that he is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Follow him because you believe that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father except through him. Jesus says, follow me. 
So I have to ask this question. Have you come to that place in your life where you know that you're following Jesus? Have you come to that place where you've made that, that decision that has resulted in a life-changing relationship with the Son of God, the Savior of the world? Ha, do you believe that he actually died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead? And have you made that commitment to follow Christ with your life? You see, Jesus is inviting us to follow him. And, and if you haven't made that commitment, if you haven't taken that step, then the most important thing you can hear today is the answer to this question because we want to know, how do I have eternal life? Following Jesus. It's realizing that you can't save yourself. Actually, none of us can save ourselves. This guy in the story couldn't save himself. I mean, he thought he was a good guy, right? He thought he had it all together. He was religious. He was good. He kept all these commandments and stuff like that. He's probably better than any of us. He didn't have it. He didn't have eternal life. And so if you're sitting here and you're kind of going, I, I'm not sure that I've taken that step of committing myself to Jesus, then, then you and God can have a conversation right now where you just simply say, God, I need you. Please save me. Please forgive me. Please give me eternal life. I'm going to follow you the rest of my, my life. If you don't know how to do that, you want to talk with someone about that, after the service, pastors are going to be available at the connection centers. Stop by and talk to us. The prayer team will be here at the front. Stop by and let them pray for you. Because there's no more important question that you can answer for yourself than have you experienced that life-changing relationship with Jesus. Following Jesus. You see, we're not going to get eternal life because of what we do. It's just not going to happen. We need Jesus. Don't you love that thing when Jesus said what's impossible with man is possible with God? See, our salvation uh, dependent on ourselves is impossible, but with Jesus it's possible because he died for us. He gave himself for us. This man believed he was a good person. Didn't, didn't you catch that? He said, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, be perfect. Keep the commandments. You know what they are. The guy goes, done that since I was a kid. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read that, the first thing that I think of is, sure, you did. Right? I mean, because publicly we all look pretty good, you know, most of the time, as long as, you know, they don't read the police speed or anything. And, uh, you know, we, we can look pretty good, and we, maybe we can fool people into thinking that we really are good, but we know that he's not as good as he thinks he is. Right? Because of what Jesus taught. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said, Hey, you know, guys, uh, you might think you haven't committed adultery, but if you look at a woman and lust after her, you're guilty of adultery. Oops. Or, or how, about, guy, how about this? If, if, you, uh, if you're angry at somebody, so much so that you hold a grudge against them, that you're unforgiving, that you're so angry you could spit nails, you know, that kind of anger, you've committed murder in your heart. You're guilty. You're guilty. You're not innocent. You're, you're not as good as you think you are. So that's the first thought. The second one is, uh, and maybe you didn't notice this. You'd have to like really be intense on the Ten Commandments to know this. Jesus left out one of the commandments. When he said to the man, do not commit adultery, do not commit murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not or honor your father and your mother, he left out, do not covet. Interesting, isn't it? Maybe it's because Jesus knew his heart. And he knew what was blocking him from really finding freedom for his life. Um, see, that's the thing. Jesus knows our hearts. I, I mean, God sees everything that we do. He, he sees all of our actions, all the places we've been, all the things we've done. He knows all that stuff, but he goes beyond that. He actually knows what you're thinking. He knows the dark places in your heart, the evil thoughts, the impure thoughts, all that kind of stuff. And get this, he knows that and he still loves you. That's kind of cool, isn't it? That's amazing grace that God knows us and loves us and Jesus wants to bless us and lead us into life. And, and that's what he did with this young man. So Jesus looked him in the eye and he challenged this rich ruler, do you love me more than your money? Jesus challenged the rich ruler, do you love me more than your money? That, that's what he said when, when in verse 22, Sell everything that you have, distribute it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. You lack this one thing, this one thing that's getting in the way of your intense, real relationship with the living God, and that is that you love your stuff more than you love God. So get rid of your stuff and come and hang out with me, and you'll experience joy and life and hope. And, uh, and he didn't do it. He couldn't do it. 
Now, understand, this is a conversation between Jesus and this one guy. It is not a universal command that all of us need to sell everything and give it to the poor uh, so that we can follow Jesus. Jesus doesn't tell all of us to sell everything. Uh, We know this because we read the whole Bible and not just this one encounter, and this is the only time that that statement is made. Uh, There's lots of examples of people selling stuff and giving it to to God. Uh, But there's also, you know, teachings. Like the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 6 has this really long teaching about money, and in there he talks about those of you who are followers of Jesus that God has blessed with a lot of wealth. Here's how you're to handle that. Here's what you're to do with that. And and, uh, by the way, all of us ought to probably read 1 Timothy chapter 6, because we live in America, that means we're all rich, and, uh, you know, at least in comparison, and, and so we ought to recognize that, and we ought to hear what God has to say to us about how we handle money, but, but this doesn't universally apply to all of us, and some of you are relieved because of that. Some of you are right now, are sitting there going, oh good, I, I'm glad he didn't say we all had to sell everything, because I like my stuff, but don't take too much comfort Because the truth is, Jesus will challenge us about anything that prevents us from following him. Jesus will challenge us about anything that prevents us from following him. What gets in your way of following Jesus? What inhibits your obedience, your commitment, your love for your Savior? It it may be a bad habit, or it may be something really good. But what is it that's getting in your way? You see, the thing that caused this man to stumble, that plagues many of us, if not all of us, was greed. He lost the battle with greed. And, and, and did you notice that when he lost the battle with greed, that he went away sad? You can read all the Gospels through, and you're going to find one person that had a face-to-face encounter with Jesus, and Scripture tells us they left his presence sad. That's this man. It's this man. Because he lost the battle with greed. And by the way, greed is smooth. Greed is very professional. Greed is covert. It hides in the dark places in our souls, waiting to sneak out and surprise us at the inopportune moments. Just like it surprised this man who thought he was good, who thought he was seeking God, who thought he was on the right path, and he was blindsided by this enemy within. So I want to talk about some indicators of greed. I want us to do kind of a a heart test, because none of us really wants to be called greedy, and I don't like labels anyway. Uh, But this is about awareness. Being aware of our hearts and our lives so that we can let Jesus change us. But remember, he's going to challenge us at whatever prevents us from following him. And, And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then that means that you're on a journey. And every one of us is on a different place on this journey if we're following Jesus. And what Jesus is interested in is you taking the next step of faith, the next step of obedience. So I'm just going to share these indicators of greed. And I want you to look at your life and just kind of assess and figure out where you are and uh, so that you and God can have a conversation about how he wants to change you. So here we go. Indicators of greed. See if there's some greed hidden in your heart. First indicator is I want more. I want more. In other words, you never have enough. You're not content. You are just kind of in a default place. You're dissatisfied with how much money you have and how much stuff you have. Is your house never big enough? Is your car never new enough or cool enough? Do you always talk about needing better things, uh, bigger wardrobe, more shoes, more purses, new golf clubs? You see, I believe at some level we all struggle with this. We all want more. And here's why I believe that all of us struggle with this. I've had lots of conversations with people through the years, and and I've heard people talk about their, their pay right? Their salary, what they make on their job. And, uh, and I'm just going to ask you to join me in confessing. Am I the only person who's ever complained about how much money I made? Anybody else ever do that? A- okay, thank you. Uh, next week I'm going to preach on lying because a lot of people don't raise their hands. And, uh, but anyway, so, you know, we, we complain about that. People complain about that. Here's what I've never heard anyone ever complain about. I make too much money. 
What they pay me is just wrong. It is way too much. I am grossly overpaid. I am not worth this much money. This is, this is ridiculous. My education, my experience does not warrant this kind of pay. I should give it back. Right? No, no, you've never heard anyone say that either, have you? Now, I've, I've talked to some people who are like, I'm on the gravy train, and it's good, but they're never saying I'm paid too much. If you always want more, then maybe greed is hiding in your heart. Second indicator of greed, you value possessions over people. Value possessions over Now, it doesn't matter who you talk to. If you ask them, hey, do you value your stuff more than people? Everybody's going to say, no, 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 I value people. But do you really ever consider your stuff more valuable than the relationships in your life? In other words, have you ever yelled at your family members over possessions? And I'm not talking about sisters fighting over clothes or jewelry or bathroom time, okay? What I'm talking about is parents or adults just losing it, going off because your hands are dirty and you're going to make it ruin that. And you're getting that dirty and you're going to break that. Put it down. Don't touch that. Stay away from that. If you've ever been on the receiving end of that, you know at that moment that that possession is way more important than you are. Or, or, or maybe check this part out. Do you have nice toys that you won't let anyone else use? In other words, if someone you knew and valued legitimately needed to borrow your car tomorrow, could you do that? Could you do it easily? Or would it create a lot of angst and struggle in your life? Now, see, a lot of times in the church, we, we excuse that behavior, and we actually blame God because we just are being good stewards. I'm just be, good stewardship. I've got to take care of my things. But there is a fine line between being a good steward and valuing the thing more than the people. If you value possessions over people, then uh, that's a good indicator of greed lurking in your heart. Third indicator of greed, you judge people by their net worth. You judge people by their net worth. Do you treat people differently based on their socioeconomic status? See, we're all tempted to judge. We're all tempted to, at that point. That's why Scripture teaches us about not judging one another uh, and not favoring one another. But do you honestly evaluate people's worth by the size of their house or where their house is or the kind of car they drive or, or how much money you think they have? Do you, do you give preference to wealthy people and ignore others? If that's the case, then you maybe have greed in your heart. Fourth indicator of greed, you're always planning the next big purchase. Right? Is your conversation always about what you're buying next? Got to get a bigger house, got to build a new house, got to, you know, get a new car, got to, you know, buy some more jewelry. Or how about this? I know no one has this conversation in Havasu. Man, did you see their boat? I got to get a bigger boat. I got to get a better boat. I got to get a newer boat. I got to look cool out on the lake. You see, if you're always planning the next big purchase, then maybe greed is lurking in your soul. Fifth indicator of greed, are you stingy? I really should have used the word cheap because that's what comes to my mind. But stingy sounds more biblical. Uh, and, and if you're not sure, because again, I, I don't know very many people who just go, yeah, I'm a tightwad, I'm a cheapskate, and I'm stingy, and I don't care. Uh, I know people who are, but a lot of times they're not aware of it. So here's, here's a little test. How do you tip? You're in a restaurant, service taking care of you. Maybe they're not doing the best job. Maybe this food's good. Maybe it's not. But how do you tip in that moment? Do you look to bless the servers or do you look for reasons not to? Do you look for those opportunities to do random acts of kindness or is it something that never crosses your mind? So I'm going to confess something right now. If you go out to dinner with me, out to lunch with me, first of all, I'm going to try to pick up the check, okay? Because that way I can leave the tip. And I make sure that it's a good tip. But if you pick up the check, I'm going to offer to pay the tip because that way I can be sure it's a good tip. If you say, no, you've got it, I am going to try to read your writing upside down across the table <laughs> to make sure that you leave a good tip because here's why. And by the way, I confess, I have gone back after that person left and left more money because they were cheap. And... Uh, <laughs> And I don't want to preach at that point in time because that's kind of, kind of rude. That's not why I went to lunch. Uh, but, but see, here's the thing. When I go out to eat, it doesn't matter if it's in Havasu or anyplace else, I don't tip for service. I don't tip for food. I tip for Jesus because I represent Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior everywhere I go. And you go out to lunch after the service and people are going to know, hey, these are Christians. They were just in church. Now they're in my restaurant and I got to take care of them. And, and the way that you tip 
represents Jesus. And a lot of us are making Jesus look bad. And I don't want to be that person. I don't want you to be that person either. Tip for Jesus. But if it never crosses your mind to be generous, to do things for other people, then maybe, just maybe, uh, you got greed in your heart. Now, if you're not sure about this or others on the list, um, I just dare you, ask your family or friends. I mean, you know, sit down with them and earnestly say, hey, I want you to be truthful with me. Because sometimes we don't see ourselves like others see us. And if you're cheap but you think you're generous, you ought to know that. So ask them. And, you know, if it goes bad, we offer counseling as well. So um, <laughs> that's okay. Now, if you're like me, then you probably identified some areas of life affected by greed. And Jesus wants to confront our greed because greed is poisoning our lives. It's tearing us apart. It's reducing our influence for his kingdom. And quite honestly, it kills our joy. It just kills our joy. Uh, let's go back to the guy in the story, right? Came to Jesus. He's all, you know, hey, I know I need this. But when he couldn't do what Jesus wanted, he went away sad. And I don't know about you, but I don't want you to leave here sad today. I want you to leave here filled with joy. So that means that we got to hear what Jesus has to say because he wants to fill our lives with joy. And if we are held captive by greed, it's going to ruin our lives and steal our joy. So greed is this poison in our hearts. Let's look at antidotes to greed. Antidotes to greed. Uh, what's going to bring health to our hearts? It's going to challenge the greed and reduce its impact on our lives. Two actions that will counter greed in us. First one is gratitude. Gratitude. Practice giving thanks. Uh, the Apostle Paul, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, says this. Rejoice always. Pray continually. In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you who are in Christ Jesus. Now, did you hear that? This is God's will for you if you're in Christ Jesus. So if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, it is always the will of God for you to be thankful. Now think about that for a minute. A lot of times people say, oh, I, I want to know what the will of God is for my life. It is always the will of God for your life that you be thankful. That you give thanks. Why is that so important that we be thankful? Because when we're grateful, it's like a greed killer in our souls. You know, this last year I was really good. I pulled all the weeds in the yard and I sprayed all that, you know, stuff that's supposed to keep them from growing. But apparently it, it expired because I'm starting to see weeds grow in my yard again. And, and I hate those weeds because I, I just want to pull them once and be done with it, right? But it doesn't happen. They're going to come back because they grow naturally. Guess what? Greed grows naturally in us. And we need that gratitude to be the greed killer in our souls so that it, it wipes them out and confronts them because greed focuses on what it wants, not what it has. Greed is always thinking about what it wants and what somebody else has, but not what it has. Gratitude focuses on what it has, considers it a blessing, thanks God for it, and that re results in joy in our lives. Did you get that? Gratitude focuses on what it has, is thankful for it, expresses that thanksgiving to God, and when we do that, it brings joy into our lives. And that's why... Jesus wants us to be grateful. So practice praising God. Every day, express your gratitude for things small and great. It'll protect your heart, it'll improve your attitude, and it'll bless the people who are around you. They would like that. Um, now notice I said practice gratitude. Because gratitude does not come naturally for us. Greed comes naturally for us. Why? Because we are natural-born sinners. Every single one of us, we're predisposed towards sin. Uh, here's the evidence. You know, you ever been around a toddler? Toddlers lie. <laughs> right? Now, I've yet to meet a parent who said, okay, today I'm going to teach my child how to lie. They just figure it out. Wait, you ever been around them when, when they're defiant? Right? And you're saying no, 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 and they still doing what they want. You did not teach them defiance, but they're good at it. 
That's because we're natural born sinners. And, and so the greed in our life is a natural result. We gravitate toward greed because that's what our souls call us to. And God says, I want you to confront that greed. I want you to practice gratitude. We have to practice it because it doesn't come naturally. And if we practice it enough in our lives, then, then it will actually begin to protect us from the greed. And so when those moments happen where the greed pops up, the gratitude will kill it and we'll win the battle with greed. Here's what it looked like in my life. Uh, I came to Calvary in 1992 as pastor, and the church was a small church, and the salary matched. Okay? It, the salary was so good. The first year that I was here as pastor, I had to throw a paper route in the mornings uh, and then, you know, come preach after that. Uh, in fact, uh, I had to give up the paper route because we grew so much as a church, we had to add a second service, and that's the 8 o'clock service. So that's when I quit the paper route. And, and the church was growing, and God was doing great things, and uh, the personnel committee, which was, you know, still thinking kind of small church, offered, you know, uh, after I'd been here a few years, a small raise. And some people in the church said, and I was really glad they did, they said, that's not enough. You need more. So we're in the business meeting where we're voting on all that stuff. It was great times back in the day when everybody's looking at your pay and deciding whether or not you're worth it. But... Uh, but these people got up and said, hey, we, we want to pay the pastor more. We want to, like, double the, the raise or whatever. And I'm like, yes. So I had to leave because now they're talking about me. So, I, you know, and I don't stand at the door and cheat or anything. I go in the, in the other room and I'm office, and I'm just kind of, like, assuming that that's a no-brainer. And the church voted no. Yeah, see that groaning that you guys did? My soul was doing that only louder. Okay, I was angry. I was hurt. I was frustrated. I was disappointed. I was just, I was mad, okay? And, you know, how could they do this to me? And, and, and how, you know, that's just so unfair and so wrong. And so I did uh, what I always do when I'm upset and angry and frustrated. I prayed. Now, you might think that you're too angry to pray. You're never too angry to pray. Okay, when you're angry, when you're frustrated, when you're, that, the best place to go is vent to God. Okay, I'm just telling you, that's perfect time. He can handle it. So I'm doing that. I'm venting to God. God, how could this happen? How could you let this happen? Do you know what your people did to me? What this church did? Why don't you take me to be a pastor of a church that really appreciates their pastor and do all this kind of stuff? And I'm just being a baby, okay? I am just whining to God like you would not believe. And, and God spoke to me. Now, when I say God spoke to me, what I mean is that 99% of the time when I say God spoke to me is that suddenly a verse from the Bible that I had recently read um, suddenly popped into my mind. And I was getting ready to preach a series on Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, and uh, Hebrews 13.5 uh, suddenly burned into my mind, and it was like God reached out through the pages of the Bible and slapped me across the face. Because here's what he said. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For never will I leave you, never will I forsake you, says the Lord. Okay. And suddenly in my tirade of anger and frustration, it was like God said to me, Chad, are you grateful that I love you and sent my son to die for you? Well, yeah, God, you know, I'm, I'm extremely grateful. I know that hell would be my destination without Jesus, and I'm so thankful that, that you love me enough to, to save me. And Chad, are you grateful that I've adopted you into my family and you're going to share in the inheritance of the kingdom? God, I, I know that. I'm grateful for that. And I'm, I'm thankful for that's the promise. And Chad, you know, I, I let you serve me. Are you grateful for that? Well, God, you know I'm grateful for the opportunity because I don't deserve it. I don't, I'm not worthy of being a pastor. I'm not worthy of, of representing you in any way, shape, or form. And yes, I'm extremely grateful for, for that opportunity. And this is the one that just really stuck. And he said, then you need to realize this. I am responsible for your pay. It's not those people and it's not the church. It is the living God who is responsible to bless you. And never will I leave you and never will I forsake you. And I left that time of prayer, instead of being angry and upset, being humbled and thankful that I got to be the servant of the living God. You see, gratitude, the practice of gratitude will make you aware of how much God has blessed you and how we don't 
look, guys, we're not getting what we deserve because we deserve hell, we deserve punishment, we deserve torment, and we're getting life, and we're getting forgiveness, and we're getting heaven. But if you don't practice gratitude, greed will jump up, and it'll keep you angry and bitter for lots of things. Second antidote to greed is generosity. The discipline of giving. The discipline of giving. To confront the greed in the rich ruler's life, Jesus prescribed giving. One thing you lack, one thing you need to do, sell everything you have, give it to the poor, come follow me. Life's going to be great. We're going to experience joy and wonder like you would not believe. Um, And the truth is, Jesus prescribes giving for us to protect our lives from being held captive by greed. God commands his followers to give a portion of what they make, uh, of the blessing that he's given them to honor him and to teach us to be generous. See, that's why generosity starts as a discipline because we don't want to do it. Again, because our natural inclination is to be greedy, is to hold on to what we have. And God says, I, want, I don't want you to be captive to greed, so I want to teach you how to give. I want to teach you how to give it away so that you can be free from this poison in your life. And and so we have to do it when we don't feel like it so we learn how to give away our stuff because greed doesn't want to give anything away. And just to be blunt, God asks us for 10%. It's called a tithe. You can find it throughout scriptures. Uh, In the Old Testament, he asked them to give 10% of their crops that they were raising, of the animals that that were birthed to them, all that kind of stuff. That was made as an offering to God. We don't tend to raise crops and and animals, so, you know, it's 10% of our paycheck. And he asked for that so that we can practice letting go. So that we can learn how to be generous so we can win the battle with greed. For our souls. Um, It kind of looks like this. And and here's the question I'd ask you. Are you living your life open-handed or close-handed? Open-handed or close-handed? See, here's the deal. If you're open-handed, you can receive things from God, and then you can give them away. So you can receive a blessing from God, and you can share it with other people. You you get from God, and he blesses you, and you're like, hey, thank you, God, and I'm going to give some away. I'm going to give some away. I'm going to give some away. And it's a cycle that keeps happening if we live our life open-handed. We receive from God, because you can receive with open hands, and then you give it away, because you're not holding on to it. Close-handed. Right? Your hands are closed because you're greedy, because it's mine. I'm going to hold on to it. I'm not going to let go of it. I'm not going to give it away. Um, Now, here's the thing. Can you receive anything if your hands are closed? I actually had some people in one service go, well, with your elbows. Yeah, try that. It's not going to be very good. No, you can't. And see, so what that does, if you're living your life closed-handed, then what you're doing is you're depriving God the opportunity to bless you. Because you can't receive anything if you're closed-handed. So you're cutting yourself off from the blessings of God by holding on to what you have instead of giving it away so that you can receive more. And see, God wants to teach us how to give away so that we can live in his blessings. And and here's the thing. If you're serious about winning the battle with greed, you have to commit to grow in your generosity. And if you commit to grow in your generosity, then you're going to be amazed at how God blesses your life and fills your hands with good things. See, it's not wrong to have. It's just wrong not to be generous. So are you living life open-handed or close-handed? Now, some in this room, if we're just honest with ourselves and with God, are living captive to greed. Greed is killing your joy. It's limiting your influence for the kingdom. And God is challenging you to practice gratitude and embrace generosity. Uh, Now, if you're new to this following of Jesus thing, then um, here's what I'm going to challenge you to do. I'm going to challenge you to go home, reread this story in Luke 18, read 1 Timothy 6. I have mentioned that earlier. And you and God have a conversation about what he wants you to do. But if you've been following Christ for a while... And God is speaking to you clearly about this, and you've been resisting him, you've been living life closed-handed, then I really want to 
challenge you this morning because I know that some of you are really in a place where spiritually you're stale. Spiritually, you're kind of stuck. You've kind of hit a wall. You've kind of got an obstacle in front of you, and you keep thinking, hey, I want to get closer to Jesus, but I don't know what's keeping me from getting there. I'm going to suggest that if your spiritual life has hit a wall, then there's one of two things. It's either unforgiveness or it's greed. It's either you're not willing to forgive someone or you're not willing to forgive yourself or you're not willing to be generous as a person. Those are the two biggest obstacles that get in the way of us really experiencing the life that God has for us. And if that's you today, then especially at the point of generosity, then I'm just going to challenge you to choose to begin your journey to generosity and joy. And, And if you're sitting there going, I don't really know if I can do that, then let me just offer this. All of the pastors on our team would be glad to sit down with you one on one and talk with you about what this looks like in your life. Because all of us have fought this battle and win it most of the time. And we want to see you win the battle with greed. The question is, do you? Let's pray together.